It is my great pleasure from House Call Providers to welcome Kelly Ambrose. Kelly has developed and managed palliative care programs since 2015. She currently leads the Advanced Illness Care Team at House Call Providers. Uh, this team serves seriously ill Care Oregon members, uh, the only community-based palliative care program in Oregon focused exclusively on Medicaid patients. Care Oregon has provided a community-based palliative care benefit for over 12 years. Kelly herself has more than 20 years of healthcare experience, including 17 years as a nurse serving high-risk populations in the community and in federally qualified health center. Throughout her career, Kelly has worked as part of a multidisciplinary team addressing socially complex patients' needs, medical needs, as well as their access to care, housing, food insecurity, and navigating the complexities of our ever complex healthcare system. Uh, again, uh, health call providers have served patients in the Portland metro region since 1995, uh, offering home-based primary care, hospice, and palliative care services. It's my super great pleasure to welcome Kelly Ambrose. Kelly, please take it away. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'd like to start by echoing Vanessa's uh, sentiments about the presenters today. I'd like to say that Vanessa and other providers at Compass Oncology have been amazing partners with care of these really complex patients with us. Um, and I'd also want to say that I'm so proud of the work of our hospice team um, who are able to care for these complex patients that my team serves. We hand them off to them with complete confidence that these patients will be well cared for. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank my own team, uh, the Advanced Illness Care Team, who does this hard work of caring for our patients and they take care of each other along the way. So I, uh, like Paul said, I've been working in healthcare for a while. It's actually a second career for me, um, but uh, it's, you know, it's been a great joy to work in palliative care these last eight years. And um, most of my nursing experience has been in the community um, and seeing folks in these uh, difficult situations. And I think that really has informed this work and this program that we've created at House Call Providers, this Advanced Illness Care Program. Uh, many programs, I'd also like to say, often have a, an exclusion. Many community-based palliative care programs exclude patients that have an active substance use disorder or a severe persistent mental illness. And I think because of my experience in community mental health, it was really important to me that we not exclude these patients. Um, we just have to look at them with a little bit different lens and figure out how we can serve them um, instead of just saying, no, we can't serve them. So the Advanced Illness Care Program at House Cover Writers is a community-based uh, palliative care team. Um, Currently, we only support Medicaid members living with serious illness in the Portland metro area. Uh, we think about serious illness conditions uh, to as cancer, CHF, COPD, neurodegenerative diseases, um, multiple chronic conditions. Um, it's, it's quite inclusive with our program that we have. Um, Community-based teams can meet patients in their homes uh, at clinics, we can see patients while they're in the hospital. Um, we really are the eyes and ears of the patient's provider in the community. Um, and we, uh, we work hand in hand with, uh, with providers like Vanessa Sine, uh, who is a clinic-based provider, as well as even inpatient care teams will reach out to us, will refer to us. Um, when our patients are in the hospital, we're coordinating with them. Um, so it's it's a part of the whole complement of palliative care that can be available to a patient. Um, we always like to say palliative care is appropriate at any stage of a serious illness, even while patients are pursuing curative treatment. So that makes it a little bit different than hospice. Um, and we don't like to say they have to have a terminal illness or they have to be within so long a period before death. Um, there's not really a, a prognosis. Um, of, of where they need to be with their illness. Um, and about 25%, and this is pretty eye-opening to me when we really did a deep dive and looked at it uh, with some data uh, that we uh, accumulated, that 25% of our patients currently have an active substance use disorder.
So my team includes nurses, social workers. We have community health workers that really focus on a lot of that social determinant stuff. Um, we have access to spiritual care. Um, we have a palliative trained pharmacist that uh, works with my team as well as providers in the community that we work with. Um, we have access to our hospice volunteers program uh, for our patients and we've deployed them on many occasions. Uh, this team uh, receives extensive training in trauma-informed care, motivational interviewing, equitable language access. We have many immigrant and refugee patients that we serve, as well as uh, communication skills, uh, especially around uh, you know, serious illness care conversations. What this, what this program can do in the community is uh, it's, it's, it's just, there's many elements to it, um, but primarily we're working on the trifecta of of what palliative care programs can do. We're working on symptom management. Um, we are engaged in tremendous care coordination um, with the patient's providers, uh, their specialists, other members of their healthcare team. Um, we are working on advanced care planning with the patient. Um, we manage patients through their uh, transitions in care, whether it's from hospital back to home or hospital to SNF back to home, um, transitions to hospice. Uh, we help patients identify their surrogate decision makers. We are, there is a constant conversation around the patient's goals um, and attempts to engage them in advanced care planning um, and help them receive the care that is consistent with their goals. Um, with this population, since we serve primarily, well, only a Medi Medicaid population at this time, um, there is a lot of social determinants work. Um, Many patients come to us, many patients that Vanessa even uh, refers come to us, they've been diagnosed with cancer and they're houseless. Um, and I'm proud to say that our team has housed about 40 patients in the last two years um, while they were na navigating a serious illness. Um, we provide social and spiritual support. And like I said, we facilitate these transfers to hospice. And I just like to call out some of these beautiful photos. They were taken by Leah Nash for a New York Times article that was done about the work of this team. And she really captured our patients and um, the clinicians that are caring for them. So we had to give her credit uh, in this presentation. Something that some of you may be aware of is that in uh, 2021, the Oregon legislature passed a palliative care bill saying that the Medicaid CCOs must provide community-based palliative care benefit to their uh, members. And that law was actually effective January 1st, 2022. It was a little delayed uh, getting to the rulemaking process, but that, um, that work is now in the rulemaking process with the Oregon Health Authority. And I think that we're, because of this, we're going, we're going to see robust uh, palliative care supports for really vulnerable patients uh, in the community that need it. I'd like to share this slide because um, as, as providers in the community are looking at providing community-based palliative care support for their, 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 these patients with serious illness, um, that the you know, research does show um, that Medicaid recipients experience higher rates of substance use disorder. Um, and this slide, this is filtered actually just for substance use disorder. Um, so it's not including the folks with mental illness in this uh, or separate mental illness. Um, and this comes from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health uh, in 2020. Um, and uh, it did show 21% uh, for, for Medicaid patients, 16% for private insurance, um, nearly as high for uninsured patients. In Oregon, we don't really see a lot of uninsured patients anymore because we've expanded Medicaid and so many people have coverage, which is fantastic. Um, it, but Medicaid and relief do have the highest overall prevalence of moderate to severe mental illness or substance use disorders. And additionally, these same patients that the Kaiser Family Foundation also um, showed, uh, the, the adult patients on Medicaid um, that these same patients are likely to have two or more chronic conditions as well. So kind of coalesces with the folks with experiencing serious illness. So, so we didn't have to exclude patients with substance disorder, disorder use disorders from our practice um, and our program. 
um, it took a while for us to distill down. Like we would we would try with every patient that we initially received, and then we realized we were hitting dead ends with a lot of folks, but we were having great success with other folks um, that were able to engage with us in our services um, in community-based palliative care. And so from that work, now we look at these patients through this lens of when they come to us with an active substance use disorder, um, these are questions that we ask ourselves um, as we review the referral. Um, what's the patient's substance of choice? Uh, is there a co-occurring mental health diagnosis? Um, has this uh, previously been a bar barrier to engagement where somebody with uh, a substance use disorder and perhaps schizophrenia, uh, if they are connected to a high level of mental health support um, and they are engaging with those providers, we think that sometimes we can take a chance and we can attempt uh, to work with them. Um, if they're completely disengaged from mental health services um, or any, any of their providers, that's gonna prove to be a bigger barrier. So that's why we're looking at what barriers are there, are they engaging, um, and, and what involvement is there with behavioral health uh, providers? Are they expressing an interest in behavior change? Sometimes these folks come to us, they've had a long hospitalization, maybe for substance use induced heart failure, um, and they've had a good long period of time where they're engaging with their providers, they're interested in pursuing possibly treatment when they get out, but I would like to acknowledge there's big barriers to treatment, especially residential level of treatment for folks that are experiencing a serious illness. Usually medically complex folks are excluded um, from our residential treatment programs. Um, is there a way we can help or pull in support to help that patient get engaged with behavioral health services? Obviously we have a great partner in Care Oregon um, with a lot of behavioral health supports. Um, we're able to work with their teams to get people connected. Um, we also look at what's going on with the patient in the home. Who's supporting the person at home? Is there a spouse or partner involved in their care? A parent? Um, do they are they uh, uh, do, are they qualified for caregiving hours through uh, uh, aging and disability services? Is there a long term consistent caregiver in the home? Um, and like Brian talked about safety with his team, we're also thinking about safety with our team. We're talking about it from the very start um, when we get these referrals. So if you get this referral with someone with active substance use disorder, and we go through all this and we think, I think we can engage with this patient, our next step is to bring it to our interdisciplinary team um, to discuss it, um, because I feel like these clinicians that are working in the community every day are able uh, to look at it through a different lens than perhaps me, um, and uh, ask the questions and uh, you know think about all the factors at play. Um, we'll consider a two-person uh, visit for the admission because we're doing that in the community at the patient's home. Um, and then after that initial evaluation, we'll talk about it at our next IDT and then ongoing until it's clear that there aren't any uh, concerns related to substance use disorder or safety ongoing. So I'd like to just talk really quickly about another uh, patient of ours named Alicia. Um, Alicia, uh, was a 39 year old female when she was referred to us from uh, Richmond Clinic in Portland, who has been also a great partner um, for our program. Um, she had a severe alcohol use disorder. It was absolutely the driver of her serious illness. She had end stage liver disease, chronic pancreatitis, ascites due to her alcoholic cirrhosis. She had GI and esophageal ulcers. Um, she had high utilization frequent ED visits for pain, uh, requesting narcotics, um, and it was it was real, real pain. Um, she often left AMA when she wasn't getting uh, what she what she needed. When she was referred to us, she had just been hospitalized for a GI, severe GI bleed that led to hemorrhagic shock. Um, we, I'll skip over this one. I will say care coordination was huge and uh, a, a big partner in the care of Alicia for us was a social worker with Tri-County 911 named Claudia, who had been working with Alicia for a long time. Um, and she was brought in uh, because of probably the high ED utilization. Um, when we met with Alicia, she had a provider at uh, Richmond Clinic, I think who was a little bit newer of a provider and wasn't quite 
experience like maybe some other providers in the clinic around um, harm reduction and, and working with some of these complex patients like Alicia. Um, so we helped facilitate a transfer to one of the very experienced uh, physicians at Richmond Clinic. Um, we met with her in the clinic. Uh, she was able to talk about her goals. She wanted to live in her own apartment. She wanted to be able to cook food. She wanted to live long enough to see her son graduate from high school. Um, we went to almost all of her appointments with her to her specialist and her PCP. We were with her through all her transitions in care in and out of the hospital, uh, phone calls after ED visits. Sometimes we'd meet her in the ED when she was there. Um, she did engage in advanced care planning and her goals were to live as long as possible so she could see her son graduate from high school. Um, and we supported uh, that goal but she was pretty realistic about um, her prognosis. Uh, she wanted uh, the team to help her uh, arrange for um, what would happen with her body after her death, which we were able to do. This team, uh, I'll just give them a shout out, Lisa Perlstein and Nicole Sacedo, who are amazing clinicians, um, were able to provide Alicia with uh, support without judgment all through her care with us. Um, because I would say Alicia was semi-consistent in her engagement uh, and we considered discharge many times, but she just had enough engagement <laughs> with her provider, um, with the team that we could hang in there with her. Um, she was eventually admitted to hospice. Sadly, it was a day or two uh, before she died, um, but we really learned a lot from our care of Alicia and uh, and I think she had good people around her um, and she she had just really great communication with the team when she was uh, able to engage. Um, I just wanted to read something that an email I received from Lisa Perlstein who attended Lisa, Alicia's service um, after her passing. Um, she wrote, I attended Alicia's celebration of life yesterday. Her 17 year old son organized it with his foster family. He'd been in foster care for many years. Um, his foster dad is the minister of the church. It was lovely, respectful, and honest. The main message that was conveyed is that Alicia loved her son, that she did the best she could with what she had experienced in her life, um, which is hard for a child to ever understand. Alicia knew she could not care for her son, and he has been with his new family for many years. And Lisa was quite moved by this service because it was just really so full of love that we don't often see for folks in this situation. Um, I had the opportunity to work with a super talented palliative medicine doc for several years. Uh, many of you know Will Kennedy. Um, after many years of his work with hospice and palliative care pro programs, including a care organ and house call providers, um, where seriously ill uh, patients with complex social needs were served, um, Will was able to provide an excellent roadmap uh, for others who do this work, and I'm super grateful for that. And that roadmap is an article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst, um, Five Strategies to Expand Palliative Care and Safety Net Populations. Paul's gonna put it in the chat. There is a paywall, uh, apologies for that. But I'm gonna just give you a little snippet um, of uh, what Will shared. And I think that was really, a lot of it was from work with uh, this team uh, at House Call Providers. Um, but in our approach, we always have to uh, support uh, what the patient's uh, defined uh, values and goals are, um, which may be a resistance to housing, uh, continue to live in unsafe safe situations, um, folks that want to pursue aggressive measures until the last moment um, because they have like a survivor mentality and we support people really no matter what their goals are through their illness trajectory. Um, Non-abandonment is an important approach um, unless safety is an issue or complete lack of engagement, um, we don't uh, look at their ambivalence or indifference uh, as uh, a rejection of what we're trying to offer. Um, we're looking at it as a response to their trauma, to their disenfranchisement, discrimination. Um, a lot of the work uh, that we do is bearing witness. Uh, we are uh, providing attention and, and judgment as an intervention. Um, patients are often acknowledging uh, past difficult actions and regrets, and we are uh, there to listen. Um, this is a huge part 
um, that I think is so important in this work um, because it is really challenging is having solid professional boundaries. And it's something that my team is constantly talking about. Um, I have this group of like clearly empathic clinicians and this I love how we'll capture this, you know, facing exceptionally complex patient needs and um, how we uh, how we're able to serve them is that we look at this as we're serving, we're not fixing. We're not overly invested in the outcome. Um, someone may have a period of sobriety and may decide to use and they may drop out of our care. And we're not, we're not trying to fix that. We're walking alongside of them. Um, we see the person as a whole uh, and as an equal and that they deserve support. So I'm just gonna start uh, off, look, I'm going to finish actually by talking about um, Aaron, who Vanessa so eloquently captured um, his background. We did receive Aaron as a referral from Compass Oncology um, with his uh, locally advanced colorectal cancer. And as Vanessa shared, he had an active substance use disorder and he was heroin. Um, he came to us, she referred him right at the beginning of his treatment. Um, he was houseless. He was undergoing um, chemotherapy and radiation. He had a lot of symptoms. Um, he, we, uh, he was houseless when he uh, was referred to us, and he actually stayed at recuperative care program at Central City Concern, who does amazing work with so many of, another amazing partner, um, works with so many of these folks. Um, he was eventually housed. Um, we provided a lot of support around those appointments he had. Um, with pursuing uh, social security benefits, his symptom management. Aaron came on and off our program three times um, where he would just be lost to care when his use got too deep. Um, and I think that was part of what Aaron did is when he knew he was deep in his use, he stepped out. And I think he meant it as a way to protect other people around him that they weren't like with his family and with his providers that they weren't caught up in his use. Um, and uh, when he came back on that third time, he was uh, eventually referred to our hospice. Um, this in this picture is a social worker in our team, Melody Kelly, uh, who was his primary social worker through his full time with my program. And she worked in partnership with a nurse who just retired, Brenda Hartman. Um, and they have worked closely with Compass Oncology for years. Um, she was present at his hospice admission. Um, I don't think that the admission could have gone any smoother. Brian and the hospice team uh, took great care of him. And again, this credit for this photograph, this beautiful photograph to Leah Nash uh, at the New York Times. So I'm gonna turn it over to Brian here to talk about um, Aaron's experience uh, and their experience with uh, Aaron on hospice, I would uh, like to say we also learned so much from Aaron. Um, how how we can serve a patient struggling with this substance use disorder as well as undergoing this uh, intense treatment and how we can support them. And we're grateful uh, to Aaron for being willing to share his story and with his family for his family being willing to share a story as well. So um, you go ahead, uh, Brian. Thank you, Kelly. And um, I think hopefully one thing that has become clear throughout this presentation is how important this collaborative approach is. You know, Vanessa really started the ball rolling and then passed things on to Kelly and then we were able to step in um, to provide hospice care. And I think ha having colleagues who are supportive and collaborative is so critical. So at this point, you understand who Aaron is and his medical situation. When we met Aaron on hospice day one, he was actively using heroin. And what we provided was a non-judgmental listening approach. We made sure naloxone was available and we provided harm reduction information. At that point in active use, we did not begin prescribing controlled substances. 
But what we did is we spent time talking with Aaron and explaining that this wasn't some kind of final judgment, that this is something that we would continue to talk about and explore and that we would be there to meet his needs. About a week later, he was became bed bound and he could no longer obtain heroin. At that time, we started transdermal fentanyl with PRN morphine. And our strategy there, as I said before, is really to provide doses of opioid that are effective. We're not lowballing. And so pretty quickly, we started to increase his transdermal fentanyl. And by hospice day 12, his pain and symptoms were well managed. And this note from one of our social workers on hospice day 13, I think really kind of speaks to how this went. Aaron said, when asked about how he's feeling about dying, he said, I've kind of come to terms with it. I mean, it's inevitable and I can't stop it. And when the social worker asked if he was still feel, feeling fearful about the process of dying, he said, not as much. I'm not in pain and hospice has done everything they said they were going to do, so I feel okay about it. We continued to increase fentanyl and morphine to meet his needs. And by hospice day 47, a month later, he was up to fentanyl 250 mics. We were using scheduled lorazepam. And on hospice day 48, he died with his partner at bedside who reported he had been comfortable. And I think some of the things I took away from this case are that by enrolling him in hospice while he was still in active use, we were able to really develop trust and rapport and kind of start the ball rolling. The fact that his prognosis was relatively short, it meant that we could focus less on long-term management of his suds and really focus more on comfort. And I think that that focus let him kind of, and his family sort of let go of that suds piece that had been such a huge part and to really focus on the other developmental needs that he had of processing his life and preparing for his death. So this is from the New York Times article that Kelly mentioned. Um, do you want to read this piece, Kelly? Yeah, I do. Um, there's a link to this article. It's really a beautiful article by Teresa Brown. This paragraph was the last paragraph in uh, her article, the, and the many beautiful photographs. Um, and she wrote, some people would look at his life and see a failure, a person who deserved what he got. I looked at Aaron and felt inspired. He was undergoing heroin treatment heroin treatment for cancer, the radiation treatments were internal, adjusting to the idea of a colostomy, managing his heroin addiction, and trying to hold on to his humanity. His prison experience had left him bitter. I'm not worth a colonoscopy, he told me, but he ended our interview with a sincere and generous wish for his parents. I just want them to know that I love them. For your time and attention today. Uh, we are so privileged to have you with us and we hope that you found this uh, helpful and that you find this work is deeply meaningful and satisfying as we do. So thank you all for your time and your attention. Thank you to our presenters, everybody. That was absolutely wonderful and, and quite moving way to spend the morning here today. Thank you so much for sharing all of this. The difference that the three of you make and uh, and along with your teams and, and the lives of so many people when they're I think at their most in need and most vulnerable and most human is just profound and uh, I think our audience would like to, to express their thanks to you uh, for all the work that you've done and for all of the grace and uh, and positive impact you've made for so many people in Oregon and beyond so thank you friends for the work that you do it's truly amazing <laughs>